What's up, Redemption students? Welcome back. Session two of Merge Weekend. We hope that you guys are having a blast. We hope that uh, session one was an encouragement to you. We hope that uh, you guys had good discussion afterwards as we kind of looked at um, starting to, to walk through this. We looked at the natural condition of, of our egos, our, the way that we view ourselves, right? And we talked about a few different qualities of, of, of the ego and stuff like that. We used our nifty little illustration of the rubber glove. <laughs> it may make another appearance. I don't know. But <laughs> But regardless, we are excited here for session two as we dive into the freedom of self-forgetfulness. We hope this has been a blessing to you. It's been a, a huge blessing to us. Mm -hmm. And so um, we read our, our passage last time. And so this time, as, as we kind of continue the, the, the conversation, I want to focus more on verses one through four of chapter four in 1 Corinthians. And so before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and pray and then we'll read. Father, thank you. Thank you for everything that you have done and everything that you are doing through these students' lives. God, would you even now begin transforming their hearts? God, I pray for the one that is, is here this weekend that um, feels lost, um, the one that feels maybe insecure, uh, the one that maybe is, is anxious or, or fearful or afraid, God. I pray that you would begin a work in their hearts. I pray that they would see you and what you've done for them by sending your son to the cross, maybe even for the first time, that they would experience your love in a new way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, let's go ahead. If you have your Bibles, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 4. He says this, Paul says, This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of the stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Amen. And so last session, we talked about the natural condition of our ego, and there were four qualities of our ego. And this session, we're talking about the transformed view of self. And in these verses that Seth just read, Paul really exemplifies yeah. what it looks like to have a completely transformed view of ourselves. And the first quality of Paul's view of himself is that Paul does not care what anybody thinks. Look at verse 3 again. Verse 3 in this translation says, I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court, right? He says, I don't care what you think. I don't care what any human court has to say about me. Um, and again, this line of thinking is very familiar to us because in our culture, in our world today, we hear a lot about, you know, no one can judge you. Yeah. Like, yeah. who can judge me? Yeah. I'm, the, I'm the only judge of myself, right? Yeah. No one, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. This is familiar to a high self-esteem culture. Um, and this seems great at the surface because this is so familiar to us in our generation. This line of thought is everywhere. But Paul's response goes one step further. He doesn't just leave it there. Look at the rest of verse 3. He says, I, I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. That's right. This is the second aspect of Paul's transformed view of self. He says, not only do I not care what you think about me, I don't care what I think about myself. Yeah. So Paul takes it a step further than what we're used to hearing. While worldly wisdom, while social media, while your friends, celebrities will say, love yourself, who cares what people think about you? Paul says, who cares what think people think about you, but who, who cares what I think about myself? That's right. Verse 3 shows us that Paul doesn't care what he thinks about himself. He even takes it another step further in verse 4. Look at verse 4. He says, my conscience, my conscience is clear, but even that does not make me innocent. Yeah. He's saying he may even be righteous. He may even have it all together and be thinking correctly and be walking with the Lord. He may even have a clear conscience, but that does not justify him. That's right. Think about this, and, and Tim Keller brings this up. Do you think Hitler had a clear conscience? Probably. Yeah. He probably had a clear conscience. Did that justify him? Absolutely not. 
it doesn't matter whether um, whether you think that you're doing the right thing, whether you think that you have a clear conscience. Yeah. Um, so those are the two fir the first two aspects. Of he says. Paul's view, he so. says, I don't care what others think, and I don't even care what I think. And the fact of the matter is, is whether I think I'm doing it all right or not, I have a clear conscience about what I'm doing. That doesn't even justify me. Right. That doesn't make me right. And so the question then comes, where does our identity come from? If it's not in what others think, if it's not in what I think, if it's not in whether the, we have a clear conscience or not, then where does our identity come from? And where does Paul's identity come from? Well, in 1 Timothy, he's, he's writing and he addresses himself. He says, I am the chief of sinners. I am the superior sinner. I am the most evil. And so when he's thinking about himself, he is placing himself at the highest level of being a sinner. And so it's interesting, and we don't do that a lot in our culture, and our culture doesn't talk a lot about what it means to be the most sinful and evil person. He has incredible confidence, but he is extremely aware of his sinfulness. He has an acute awareness of his brokenness. He knows he is sinful, but he refuses to connect that sinfulness, those mistakes, him being the chief of sinner, sinners with his identity. And that's really, really, really powerful and really profound. And the same with his victories, mm -hmm. right? The same with his victories. They are not connected to his identity either. And the reality is, is that we are not like Paul. <laughs> we judge ourselves by what we do, and our egos can never be satisfied. And it goes both ways. Whether we do things good for God, and we show up to church, and we pray enough, and all those kind of things, we associate our identity with what we do. And the same goes for some of you people that you know associate your identity with how messed up you are, with your sinfulness and your brokenness. So I'm so this, I'm, I'm messed up here, I'm such a bad person in this way. I'm, and so we start to attach our identities to what we do. And Paul's not doing either of those things. We judge ourselves by what we do. And Paul does something kind of off of our maps. His ego does not draw attention to himself, just like we talked about last session with the toes or, or the elbows, right? It's not about us. And for Paul, it wasn't about him. And so I want to share another thing because we've, we've talked about, okay, how do we get this transformed view of self? Well, it doesn't matter what others think. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't, it's not about putting our identity in the things that we do, but it's about achieving gospel humility. It's about achieving gospel humility. And, and, and C.S. Lewis talks a lot about this, and Tim Keller brings this up a lot, and it's really, really powerful. And I want to read on, if you have this, it's on page 32. He says this, defining gospel humility. He says, gospel humility is not needing to think about myself. It's not needing to connect things with myself. Everywhere we go, everything that we do, are you trying to find a way to connect it to yourself? Are you trying to associate those things with what you're experiencing or where you're going? Or does that doesn't fit into my plans or I, that's not what I want? Or are you, and that's a good question for us to ask ourselves because that may reveal whether or not we have a true gospel humility. And this is not a high self-esteem or a low self-esteem. It's, it's actually not about self-esteem at all. And Paul re refuses to play this game, and I think that we should refuse to also. The gospel humble person is a self-forgetful person. The ego becomes like the toe or the elbow, and it's just there. We're not thinking or connecting everything to ourselves. True gospel humility is not a puffed up ego like the illustration with the rubber glove but rather a filled up ego the true gospel humility is not a puffed up ego but a filled up ego yeah and you know I, i'm i can i see a glove yeah yeah this it's funny because this illustration really came from when i was um 
when I was in middle school, I took piano lessons. And some of you might take piano lessons. Some of you might um, be, you know, play an instrument or be in dance lessons or something like that. And I remember getting so nervous for performances. And what was cool about my piano, uh, my piano teacher is that she was a, a believer. She was a Christian. She believed in Jesus. And the music that I was playing, it was worship music. It's, it's the worship that uh, we sing on Wednesday nights and on Sunday mornings. But I would get so worked up and so nervous to play the piano and to sing and to lead worship. And something that my piano to teacher told me that I will never forget is that she said, Abby, you're just like a glove. Okay, you're like a glove. Mm. And so last session, we used this glove and we filled it up with air, remember? And we talked about how, how empty and painful and busy and fragile the puffed up glove can be. Yeah. And our natural state, once we finally deflate, because trust me, you will eventually deflate. If you're finding your identity in anything other than Christ, you will eventually right. deflate. So this is who we are. In our natural state, we are... We're not super impressive. We're just a glove, right? There's nothing super, you know, remarkable about this glove. It's just there, yeah. right? But and it's pretty useless on its own, right? Like if I just, it doesn't, really do it doesn't do anything. Yeah. But the second that my hand enters this glove, suddenly this glove has a lot of use. Yeah. Suddenly, this glove can accomplish whatever it needs to accomplish because it's not puffed up like we saw last session, it's filled up. Yeah. And this is what happens when we put our faith in Jesus and who Jesus is. When we are his, we actually take on the identity of Christ. That's right. Our ego is no longer puffed up and, and ready to burst at any moment. It's completely filled up. No risk of bursting, no risk of breaking, because it's Christ's identity that animates us. Suddenly the glove takes on the identity of the hand, yeah. and the hand is Jesus. That's right. And so this, it, 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 this may sound, it, it looks easier than, uh, you know, it, it, it may be, you may be sitting there like, okay, great, like, I'm a glove, I'm puffing myself up, but like, how? How do I how do I get there? Um, and we're going to talk about that in the next sessions. But I want to keep that image in front of you. Yeah. Is your ego puffed up? Is it filled with air, completely unstable, or is it filled up mm. with the hand of Christ, with with the identity of who Jesus is? Yeah, and that's the right that's the right question to ask. Is where are you when you think about this illustration? Where where are you? Where's your heart? Where's your life? Where's your ego? Is it is it puffed up, or or is it filled up? And as we're talking about gospel humility, I want to, I want to read another quote because it's it's really really powerful from from this little from this little book when he says this and he talks about what it means to be a self forgetful and gospel humble person. He says, friends, wouldn't you want to be a person who does not need honor, nor is afraid of it and what he's talking about is wouldn't it be nice to when honor comes to be able to receive it and and to not let it puff you up but to actually just receive it with a grateful heart and also wouldn't it be nice when honor or anything else comes to not be afraid of it to not be so puffed up and so fragile and so worried that if someone says something to me, it's just going to wreck my world. Wouldn't it be nice to have that security, that stability, that whenever honor or critique or whatever may come, it doesn't phase you. It doesn't deflate you. It doesn't puff you up. It doesn't make your ego burst. But rather, you can just receive it. Wouldn't it be nice? Gospel humility, and I want you guys to write this down. If you take nothing else away from this session, write this down. He says this. He says, gospel humility, the opposite of pride, gospel humility isn't thinking less of yourself, but simply thinking of yourself less. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's not thinking more of yourself but it's thinking of yourself less. It's stopping the process of just always thinking about ourselves. Let your ego be like your toes and your elbows. And, and this is 
this is a real possibility. We would not be talking about this if this would not be something that's attainable through Christ, right? You can access this gospel humility. The enemy wants you to think otherwise, that this is something that's not attainable or not realistic. Your work, your talent, your relationship, your school is not about you. It's not about you. You can love those things for what they are and you can appreciate all of those things, but associating those things with, with you and always connecting them with yourself and always thinking about yourself is not what it's about. And so the process of thinking of ourselves less is how we achieve real gospel humility. That's right. That's right. And so this whole session, you're about to dive into some discussion questions to really process what we just talked about. But this whole session, we want to remind you, was talking about the transformed view of self. Yeah. And we define that what we're after is gospel humility, a filled up ego, not a puffed up ego. And so again, you might be sitting there saying, okay, great, this, that's what I want. How do I get there? Yeah. And we're so excited. The third session is called How to Get That Transformed View of Self. And so we're excited to be with you live at our third and final session, and we'll see you there. Mm -hmm.